play in olives and oranges since the 1880s. And so I kind of came from a farming background and ended up in New Zealand and had gone to university and studying soil science and worked well, quite a bit in soil science, soil fertility, and also horticulture, and then came to New Zealand in 2009. And since then, have been working for Ag Knowledge doing primarily fertility advice on pastures for farmers. And so with that, hmm. yeah, I'm having trouble changing slides. Oh, there we go. Yeah, with a little, for a little background or reminder, it takes 16 elements to grow a plant. Um, some of these, the structural elements, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, come from air and water. And some of the other ones are like uh, calcium and iron are in great quantities in the soil. And so you kind of don't hear about them as much. The ones you typically talk about, particularly in the South Island sedimentary soils, are phosphorus, sulfur, molybdenum, pretty commonly potassium, sometimes magnesium, sometimes copper and boron when you're dealing with crops. And depending on what you're doing, you might or might not be using nitrogen fertilizer. But these are the ones you hear about because these are the ones that tend to be limited in the natural system and need to be replenished to keep production up. And the nutrients are not used in the same quantities. Some things like nitrogen might make up you know, 5% of the dry matter of a plant, where something else like phosphorus might be a third of a percent. But they're all equally important, even though they're used in different quantities. And an important concept to understand is that the most limiting nutrient is what sets the pace of growth of the plant. So if you have very high levels of everything, but you're low in sulfur, the plant is gonna grow at the rate that the sulfur allows. And another thing to keep in mind is that clover has much higher nutrient requirements than grasses. Um, grasses have you know, pretty extensive root systems, kind of scour the earth. They'll grow in fairly low fertility conditions as long as they're getting some nitrogen. The clover's not like that. It's got short, stubby little oniony roots and has higher nutrient requirements. And so really the fertility programs and pastures is aimed at clover. And if there's a nutrient issue, it shows up in the clover first. And you might wonder, how do you know how much nutrients are required to maintain you know, maximum production? And science comes up with answers. Um, this photo is an example of a fertilizer experiment. It's up near Amerima. In this case, they're growing lupin and testing different rates of lime, looking at pH versus growth. And in New Zealand, there have been thousands of fertilizer experiments. And kind of what happens is you don't do one experiment once and call it good. You do experiments over and over in different places in different years. And this is a graph looking at Olson P versus relative yield of pasture. And every one of those little blips represents an experiment that was done. And so when you glob all those together, you can fit a line to it and come up with a response curve. And this is useful in that it tells you at a given you know, Olson P level, you can expect that's about where the relative yield will be. For example, an Olson P of 20, looking at the graph will be kind of in the 90s-ish percent of potential yield. And if you're at 40, you're near the top. And because phosphorus is expensive, people don't always run up to you know, 60 or 80 to be at the very absolute maximum. It's based more on economics. As whereas a sheep farm that you know, might be running in the teens or 20s and on a dairy farm where they're making more income per hectare will run it up you know, to the high 30s or 40. So the question comes up, what happens if you stop fertilizing altogether? Um, and again, science came up with some answers to that. Uh, in the 1980s, apparently all the subsidies came off of fertilizers 
And a lot of farmers responded to the increased expense by just not fertilizing at all. And in 1990, there was a survey done looking at farms that had continued fertilizing straight on through versus those that had just flat out stopped. And the difference in profit was about three times higher for the farms that fertilized it versus those that didn't. And there were experiments done, and one of them was the Tequidi Research Farm. And by the looks of this, it was a sedimentary soil and the pH was five, six and the Olson P was 14, which meaning it wasn't a super high producing paddock to start with. And the rainfall of 1500 millimeters and the treatment was either no fertilizer or 250 kilograms a year. And this went on for five years. And what they found was the red line represents the fertilized paddock. And relative to that, you, you live weights and fleece weights dropped fairly dramatically. And this is the same study and looking at um, compared to the pasture production again, compared to fertilized. Clover production dropped by about 40% over that five years. And because of the loss of nitrogen input, pasture production dropped by about 50%. And a similar study was done, um, Ballon Tray. And again, this wasn't a real high productive paddock to start with. The Olson P was about 12, but of seven years of no fertilizing, Olson P's dropped by about 37%, pasture dropped by about 30%, U live weights dropped and U lamb weights dropped fairly significantly at 27%. And kind of looking at studies like this, sort of as a general rule, withholding fertilizer, Pasture and animal production tends to drop about 5% per year. And there's really no reason to think that will stop dropping. I mean, eventually you hit, you know, kind of a low steady state, but practically speaking, it's fairly significant. And so if you find yourself on a budget constraint, the question becomes, you know, what corners can you cut? And there are some good ways to cut corners and some poor ways to cut corners. Soluble nutrients, sulfur in particular, doesn't tend to hang around in the soil very long. And most of the sulfur in the soil is tied up in organic matter. And so it's not like phosphorus where you can put it on and build it up. It's something. You have to keep putting it on because it keeps, well, it's getting used by the plants, but it's also leaching away. And that is something you pretty much have to put on every year. And most of the South Island soils are pretty low in sulfur. And that is not a corner you can cut. And potassium as well, if you're low in potassium, it's fairly soluble. That's something you'd have to put on every year. And again, going back to the most limiting nutrient, the most limiting nutrient is the one you're going to get the most response from, and that's what you should be concentrating on. And so it's important, you know, through soil sampling to identify the most limiting nutrient, which you should be doing pretty much all the time anyway, but if you're short on funds to target, the most limiting nutrient is the most cost-effective. Lime is often a, another corner that can be cut fairly easily. Lime, you can kind of build up pH, sort of bank it in the soil and then let it work its way back down again over time. And the typical recommendation is keep pH between 5, 8 and 6. And the reason 6 is because that's the top of the response curve. If you go above that, you're not gaining anything. But if you let it drop down to like 5, 5, you lose some production, but not huge amounts, like you know 10%-ish. If you get below 5.4, then all of a sudden clover won't grow and things crash and burn. But if in a tight budget, lime is something, lime is something you can certainly skip and then make up before it in the future. 
Similarly, phosphorus is an expensive nutrient, and it is something that you can build up in the soil and mine down. It tends not to leach. And particularly if your levels are above your economic optimal and phosphorus is expensive, that's a good time to skip phosphorus and let that work its way down a little bit. And kind of as a rule of thumb, you expect Olson P to drop by one or two units a year if you skip phosphorus entirely. Uh, another strategy would be that many farms have some, you know, more productive areas and less productive areas. And if you're tight with fertilizer, you'd want to keep fertilizing the productive areas. You know, some of the high, dry, rough country you might skip, let that suffer rather than the productive parts. And crops in particular, you would not want to skimp on. The expense of putting in a crop is usually pretty high and you're going to burn just as much diesel and use just as much chemicals whether you grow a lousy crop or a good one so that is something you wouldn't want to skimp on fertilizer and generally crops are pretty important to the functioning of the farm so again don't skimp on crops and then kind of change in subjects um, alternative products yeah, it's been suggested that people start looking at less expensive alternatives when fertilizer gets expensive. And in the, in the US, I worked almost exclusively with organic farmers for about five years. And there's all sorts of wild products that people sell you as fertilizer. Um, common things are like manure, seaweed, fish, and then different versions of soluble fertilizers like fine particle fertilizers and liquids. And there's really kind of an endless thing of what people will sell you and tell you as a fertilizer. But the thing to keep in mind with these is that you're dealing with the exact same science. When I was working with organic farmers, we didn't do anything different. You know, a crop requires a certain amount of nutrients and pastures require a certain amount of nutrients to maintain production. And where you get the nutrients isn't particularly important but the plant needs those nutrients. Um, yeah, it's kind of funny. A lot of times you'd be talking to somebody and you know about soil science, and they'll say, "Oh, that doesn't apply to us. We're organic." But yeah, it, it does apply. Plants don't read the sign on the gate that says you're, you know, biodynamic or something. What they respond to is temperature, light, you know, their environment, and nutrients. It, and some of the alternative sources, you have to be a little bit careful because even though they may contain nutrients, they also things like seaweed and a lot of the fish contain a lot of sodium and you can have issues with sodium toxicity. And then a lot of areas where there's lots of manure, you know, these alternative fertilizers are really commonly used. And typically they don't get used in place of, you know, commercial soluble fertilizers it's in addition to because if you're shooting for a specific nutrient ratio, you know, chicken manure or something generally doesn't have that perfect ratio and you end up having to blend it with something else. And yeah, do the math. You want to know what you're paying for. You need to know the analysis of these alternative, you know, sources of nutrients. You have to know how much nutrient is in there and how much it's costing you. Like, you know, some seaweed fertilizer might have 2% nitrogen, but if it costs the same as urea, which is 46% nitrogen, that's really not saving you any money. And despite what the salesman says, you know, you can't put a quart of something or a liter of something on, you know, per hectare and expect to replace, you know, hundreds of pounds of nutrients. And so, yep, do the math, calculate it out and see what you're actually paying for and know what you're getting. And with that, I don't know if I'm out of time or not, but I tend to talk fast. Thanks for that, Robert. Um, you've got a little bit of time left, but um, that's all good. We can make up for that with questions at the end. So if, just a reminder, if you haven't already and you've got a question, please feel free to type it into the chat box. Um, and while you're doing that, we'll get Ants on to talk about 
um, spreading. So if you just a reminder where the chat box is, just hover your mouse um, below the screen and you'll see a little chat icon. If you click on that, the chat box will pop up. Um, Radio, thanks very much for that, Robert. That was useful and it was um, really, yeah, it was great to highlight some of the key concepts that um, farmers need to bear in mind when planning fertilizer for this season. Um, I know our attendees have lots of questions, so hopefully we can get to those at the end of the session. Um, now I'd like to introduce Dr. Ants Roberts. Um, Ants is a highly regarded soil scientist and the Chief Scientific Officer for Ravensdown. Ants has spent several decades working in agricultural research in New Zealand um, with a focus on soil fertility management. And more recently, he was involved with a PGP research program called Pioneering to Precision, which focused on increasing the efficiency of nutrient um, application to hill country. But Ants is going to provide us with an update on where spreading technologies are at and how you can use them to increase the efficiency of nutrient use on your farm. Thanks, Ants. I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Nicola. Right, I'll just share the screen. see that? If you just go into the um, slideshow and start Ready? the slideshow, Ants. Yeah, there we go. How's that? Great, thank you. All right. So, um, yeah, so following on from Robert, so once you choose uh, what it is you have to apply on your farm, you know, what? what's the best way of doing it? In the past, Historically, we've tended to put the same rate on across the whole farm. But as Robert pointed out quite correctly, your farms, uh, you'll know your farms best, but the productivity of every hectare of your farm is not the same. And that's uh, because of uh, considerable variation in soil depth and therefore water holding capacity, slope, aspect, altitude, and so on. All of that affects uh, what your potential pasture production uh, will be and or crop production as well. So it um, so the newer technologies using GIS and GPS technologies and um, uh, computer controlled apertures for in terms of aerial spreading, but also in ground spread equipment as well, um, allows you to be more precise than we have in the past and apply different rates to different areas if that's appropriate. And uh, so different rates of different products in different areas. And that's quickly what I'm going to just uh, touch on. So we can be smarter um, uh, with our fertilizer use and particularly when fertilizer is at the higher end of its uh, historic uh, cost. Uh, you will be pleased to know that uh, globally we see things softening a bit, particularly in the compound fertilizers in DAP, nitrogen, not so much in phosphate rocks. So superphosphate won't come back as quickly as we'd all like, but um, it still uh, it will eventually come back, we believe. So rather than putting a single rate over the whole farm, um, without um, using technology, uh, many people have started to divide farms up into what we call different land management units based on their potential productivity. And uh, in this case, this was uh, a, a large sheep and beef farm in the um, Lower North Island in the Ponganui area, um, and uh, the uh, fertilizer um, advisor for this particular farm worked with the farm manager and divided the farm up into uh, several classes of land. Um, class one being the, quite flat and, uh, in this case, uh, volcanic soils. Uh, class two uh, being um, able to be uh, cropped, um, so reasonable contour, etc. Uh, and then also class two, which couldn't be cropped because of the contour, et cetera. And then class three, uh, uh, which uh, of which uh, part of it could have fertilizer. It was worth putting fertilizer on because of the species that were there, because of the fencing infrastructure, et cetera. And then class three, which was, the, as uh, uh, Robert said, the, the rougher, drier, perhaps, um, pony soils, et cetera. So, a significant part of the feed supply for the whole farm system and therefore you could uh, you know withhold fertilizer and just let the native grasses uh, go there and get the occasional grazing off it. 
so you treat all those different areas differently in terms of the rates and types of fertilizer that you might wish to apply. Obviously, in this particular case, the black area is significant areas of Manuka bush, but also uh, pine trees, native forests, et cetera. And so, uh, you know, excluding all those sort of areas, plus any environmentally sensitive areas, starts to reduce the amount of land on, on which to apply fertilizer. And so there's some savings there as well. A and we can now, with the spreading technology, avoid those areas pretty accurately. Um, so, uh, as Robert correctly said, we, we would encourage you to take as many soil samples as possible so that you know the soil fertility and can areas and work out for those but also what amounts of nutrients. And uh, we have um, the ability to uh, determine different soil fertility targets based on the potential productivity of the land. and um, uh, that uh, uh, Olson P uh, relative yield curve that Robert showed you, um, you know, while he pointed out that not, not all of you will want to be at the top of that curve because economically your farm system may not justify the expense of the fertilizer to get to that point. Uh, so your, your, so while the top of the curve is what we would say uh, is biologically where you've raise the soil fertility to such an extent that you'll get no further gains by raising it further. Um, but your economic optimum soil fertility may be somewhat less than that, depending on your individual farm situations. But we have a, a system of uh, uh, being able to do that based on um, either your current productivity or stocking rates, et cetera, um, and dividing the farms, as you see, there, there are those um, uh, three different classes, although two of the classes have been split out uh, into cropping and non-cropping, into food and no food. And and because the, the carrying capacity of those classes is different, then your target ranges for your soil fertility should be different as well. Um, and so this is just an example for this particular uh, farm. It's uh, got sedimentary soils, but it also has some volcanic soils as well, because it's it's actually, this farm is in the Paraparas, if you know the North Island, which is just the sort of sedimentary uh, hill country south of the volcanic plateau. And so, so some of the volcanic ashes from the volcanic plateau uh, have, are still mantling the gentler slopes of the area. And those tend to be the class one and class two cropping uh, areas. But ju just the numbers aren't important. It's the principle that uh, based on productivity, we would uh, choose different targets and therefore you choose uh, different rates of line or uh, PNSK to apply. Uh, and so that yeah. And so um, you could all, you can also uh, use that that sort of decision criteria to decide when in fertilizer can be used effectively uh, to feed stock at critical uh, periods, particularly if they are the ones that make the money for you. And so then uh, applying the fertilizer and lime differentially. And the idea is in some cases you can save money by cutting back the overall fertilizer budget or um, by increasing the productivity of your most um, productive areas. Um, uh, uh, you can uh, hopefully make more money. So here's, a, here's another sheep and beef farm, quite a large one in the Wairapa Hill Country. And um, this this uh, is a more modern map, and uh, this is based on our um, GIS uh, system. And this, this fertilizer plan uh, was created by the farmer himself um, in association with his fertilizer um, uh, advisor. Um, and it was based on his knowledge of uh, the different blocks of his farm. He, he chose three different rates of um, superphosphate in this case. The, uh, uh, ready colored areas, 200 kilograms of super, the yellowy colored areas, 250, and um, these browny, more browny areas, uh, 300 kilograms of super per hectare, because he felt that that kind of matched um, the sort of animal performance, partial productivity that he was getting from his farm. Um, and um, so uh, this is an application map showing uh, these lines are where the plane blue and uh, um, 
drop fertilizer, including these darker areas, which were the exclusion zones. In other words, areas where we didn't want fertilizer to be applied uh, and areas where we wanted different rates of fertilizer to be applied. Overall, the job was about 416 tonnes of fertilizer uh, over um, 15, 39 hectares effective. Um, and um, on 271 hectares, we did not apply or order any fertilizer. And so that's where the savings start to cut in. Not that I'm saying that even without this technology, pilots fly over bush and drop fertilizer. They don't, they try and avoid it, but we can be way more accurate. The, um, the technology that's in some planes now um, can actually um, uh, cut off the, or change the rate of fertilizer within 10 to 20 meters now. We started off, it was 70 meters. Uh, uh, now we can do it within 10 to 20 meters. So it gets pretty, pretty accurate. Um, uh, what, uh, Nicola mentioned the uh, primary uh, growth partnership that we uh, ran for about eight years. We put a hyperspectral camera into a Cessna airplane as the, as the picture shows, and we've used that to scan hill country. Um, and basically we've calibrated uh, the signals from the hyperspectral camera to the soil Olsen P status. We also hope to get uh, potassium and uh, uh, and pH out of it. We uh, have not achieved that so far. Um, and But we have uh, scanned farms uh, with the hyperspectral camera. And not only do, you, do we get Olsen P, uh, and as I say, maybe pH and K, but you also get a digital surface map, um, uh, or, um, a photo, photograph of your farm. Um, and we can calculate from that information the actual area in pasture, rather than just the uh, areas uh, predicated by the paddocks, by the, sorry, by the fences, uh, we can actually take out areas of scattered scrub, uh, tussock, et cetera, and tell you how much pasture you actually have. And that has surprised some farmers. Uh, some farmers have had more pasture than they thought it, but they had less. And we can also identify the exclusion zones and the um, sensitive areas. And we can identify different plants, um, different tree species, Monica versus Carnica, uh, other tree species. Um, that's uh, all of that stuff. Well, in fact, all of this is currently not commercially available, um, but we're working towards uh, at least making the Olsen P, the area and pasture uh, commercially available in the next year or two. But this is a sort of technology that allows you to feed into the newer precision spreading equipment. Um, and so one of the things we've also developed in this PGP is that we can um, estimate uh, your current pasture production based on your current soil fertility, based on slope, aspect, altitude, soil water holding capacity. And so, so here's that um, same station in the wire wrapper. And, and there's the estimates of current pasture production. The, the current pasture production was a little bit different than what the farmer had in his own mind, although he wasn't too bad. Um, and so the, the bright green areas are growing about uh, 6,000, uh, or six tonnes of dry matter per hectare. The red area is about four uh, uh, tonnes per hectare. But then we can um, model what would happen in terms of that pasture growth if we optimize the um, fertility um, to, uh, to basically grow as much pasture as the potential of that land, given its slope aspect, altitude, and water holding capacity. And by subtracting one from the other in the GIS system, you can get the, the relative um, differences uh, in the pasture production for that farm. So, so that you then, what does that do? That targets, um, the area, the bright green area, is obviously the area of highest potential growth. And so we might choose to put, if it's necessary, capital applications on to grow more grass in those areas while putting less on these other areas. And in fact, um, uh, that was what uh, we used to do. And after doing that exercise, this is the application plan that, that we uh, came up with and which the farmers uh, agreed to and actually applied. Um, you'll notice that um, 
uh, in w when the farmer was doing it without this technology, he cho he chose this area here to be putting it on um, around about um, two two hundred and fifty kilograms of super per hectare, based on its potential productivity uh, and the current soil fertility. We said to him, actually, you could put less. Uh, superphosphate on here, i.e. 150 kilograms, so saving 100 kilograms per, per hectare on those blue areas, and use that to put uh, to put capital rates, i.e. 600 kilograms per hectare, on the red areas to boost the productivity. And um, and basically, uh, you know, so we were robbing Peter to pay Paul, but overall the farm uh, uh, would, would lift in productivity and that would flow through into animal performance. The thing about uh, existing technology, well, you know, um, prior to this technology, uh, fertilizer decisions on a large hill country farm would be um, estimated through 10 to 20 soil transects, as uh, was uh, however energetic the, the people taking the soil samples were, and blocks basically are, de uh, are defined by paddock boundaries. Um, whereas with remote sensing and variable rate application in the plane, um, in terms of the hyperspectral camera, it takes an estimate of soil fertility every square metre of the farm. So you get 10,000 estimates per hectare, which is a hell of a lot. Um, so, you know, the, the idea being that we get a better understanding of the variability throughout that hill country. And in terms of fertiliser placement, fences are, are irrelevant. Um, we can just, because you put the map into the plane and the computer and the, and the automatic aperture opener and closer does the rest. The pilot can be safer because all the pilot has to do is fly and be safe. Uh, he doesn't have to control the hopper doors um, and so on and so forth. And the hopper changes with the airspeed of the aircraft. So as the aircraft um, dives down, it obviously speeds up and the rate changes if you don't change the aperture and vice versa as you go up the plane slows down and the aperture has to close up to, to maintain the same rate. That is all done automatically. Um, so what's the financial uh, gain in that? Well, it, every farm is different, but here's here's some modeling that was done uh, for the Limestone Downs, which is a, a big uh, sheep and beef farm on the West Coast, just uh, uh, in sort of west of Pukekohe, uh, out, right out on the coast. and um, uh, we compared blanket rate, the same rate over the whole farm, to simple variable rate application, i.e. avoiding very steep areas, scrubby areas, stock camps, et cetera, and then compared it to full uh, variable rate application. And essentially, uh, back when we did the analysis, given the costs and prices, um, the simple uh, variable rate um, gave you more, um, uh, you know, a better use of your fertilizer, more accurate, and full variable rate uh, gave you even more again, J just as an example. So uh, um, it can be, uh, you know, using your dollars better to get better bangs for your bucks um, by uh, not applying the same rate everywhere. <coughs> um, yeah, so I won't worry about that. Uh, so there's limestone downs where we applied, oh, sorry, go back. Uh, limestone downs where we applied different rates. And that just shows you uh, the target rates overlaid with the actual application rates. Not a very good um, slide, I'm sorry, but I just wanted to show you that. And, and if you've got flat land and you can use ground spread equipment, they, uh, ca they can be um, equally variable rate and, and relatively precise. In, in the case of flat land, um, basically uh, we would do it paddock by paddock and do whole farm soil testing where you'd, uh, uh, or certainly your flat areas or your flat ur areas, uh, we would test every paddock and uh, determine what was required and spread uh, within the whole paddock. Right, that's me, done. That's excellent. Thanks very much for that, Ents. Um, that was really insightful. It was great to get an appreciation for um, the level of sophistication in um, sensing and modelling technologies, and hopefully that will um, be able to flow through to um, for farmers to be able to use soon. Um, Oh, sorry, Nicola, could I just say that that I mean that technology, the spreading technology is available. It's the it's the it's the hyperspectral technology that isn't. So uh, you know, there are um, both cooperatives uh, and many of the aerial spreading companies 
uh, can do quite a bit of this, provided you provide them with what you want and where you want it. Awesome. Thanks yeah. for that clarification. Um, I have got a few questions for both our speakers. So, Robert, if you just want to jump on, um, turn your camera and um, mute yourself again. Um, I'll just jump over to you for a minute, Ants. Um, so, you kind of alluded to this, but what are the um, pros and cons of soil testing every paddock on the farm? Uh, well, I'll give you an example. Today, I was uh, it was a, was a dairy farm, I have to say, but um, we all... Uh, this was a new customer for us, uh, and he, uh, he'd obviously had a very good fertilizer history. Uh, we suggested we needed to soil test his farm on every paddock because we um, we didn't have a lot of information to go to go on. We did that. We've just been back and presented the the new plan, and instead of sending spending about seventy five thousand as he normally would in his program, uh, he's going to put on about fifteen thousand dollars of fertilizer this year thanks to the fact that he'd had a very good regular fertilizer history in the past. But, you know, at, at right at this time, he can now cash in on all his good investment in the past. So, so um, and we've done it, believe it or not, um, I, I haven't, but I, some of our reps have gone out in whole farm soil tested sheep and beef farms and done the same thing. Uh, it just gives you more information to, uh, uh, you know, you don't do it every year, obviously, um, but uh, it gives you more information to make more informed decisions. Cool, oh, that's great. Thanks, Ants. Um, a question now for Robert. Um, what are your thoughts on, so this is from a farmer who's got dry land, um, thoughts on using a 115 mil uh, rather than 75 mil soil core for um, pasture maintenance testing for dry land pasture species? Um, and is there any difference in the recommended nutrient values to aim towards at 150 mils? Um, the answer is yes, they're very different. The kind of the idea behind that is that the 75 millimeter probe we used because in past years, the vast majority of the biology of the you know, plants and soil organisms is in that top seven and a half centimeters. And as you're applying limes and fertilizer to the surface, you end up with a gradient higher at the top as it works its way down, it fades away a bit. And so because since most of the biological activity is taking place in that top seven and a half centimeters, that's what they sample. The idea behind the deep cores is that if you're gonna come in and plow that and stir it all up, and you wanna know what it's gonna look like when you're done, sampling that whole plow layer is the idea behind the 15 centimeter core. But because, you know, the response curves and everything are calibrated to that seven and a half centimeter core for pastures, I would stick with that. And there are some calculations you can do to back calculate it, but there's, no, it'd be better just to use the short probe. Oh. I don't answer, do you have any comments on that? No, I, I was just, you, you actually said what I was just going to add, um, if you hadn't said it, is that the point is that the calibration curve you showed, uh, all of them, P, K, S, P, H, for pastures, Robert's exactly right, has been calibrated to that soil depth. We could have calibrated it to 15, but we didn't. Uh, it has been done for the crops at 15 because of the reasons that Robert said. Um, so, yeah, for pastures, stick to the 7.5. Otherwise, you're starting to shoot in the dark in terms of interpreting the soil test information. Cool. That's great, thank you. Um, another one for Robert, a question regarding the cost effectiveness of split applications in situations where high, high rainfall events are causing the levels of soluble nutrients, uh, such as sulfur, to decline, even when the annual application rates are up to double maintenance requirements. Um, I'm gonna give the standard soil science answer I learned in university, and that is that it depends. <laughs> and Although rainfall is significant, it really depends on the soil. If you're in big, deep, loamy soils, you don't worry too much about leaching. Is where, I don't know, the North Island, some of got some wild soils up there in the West Coast down here, real weathered soils leach significantly. So it, it, it kind of depends on where you are. Oh, okay. But in leaching situations, it is better, more applications, more smaller applications is certainly the way to go. Great. 
Um, another one, Robert, potassium is really expensive at the moment. Can you elaborate on potassium leaching based on um, soil type C, E, C, rainfall, etc., and the rate of potential natural replenishment from the weathering of clays? As plants have a luxury uptake of K, it can be easy to overdo it and add unnecessary costs to farm systems. Should we be using TBK tests along with um, the quick test Ks? Um. There's a lot of questions in that question. <laughs> Hopefully you can read it in your chat box. <laughs> well, that's an idea. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the first one was around potassium leaching based on um, soil type CC, rainfall, etc. And the yeah, rate of replenishment. When soil scientists say potassium leaches, it, it does leach technically, but it's not, it doesn't leach like nitrate nitrogen or sulfate sulfur which really leaches i mean if you lost five or ten percent in a year that would be a lot of potassium leaching and again in terrible soils terrible soils for holding nutrients you can have you can have significant potassium leaching but generally in nice loamy soils it's not real significant and there is an issue with luxury uptake that if you're putting on large amounts of potassium, plants will take up more than they need. And it kind of becomes, makes it somewhat less efficient. But then again, you have to keep in mind is what a lot of potassium is because like in a plant, it might be three or 4% potassium as opposed to something like phosphorus, it's like a third of a percent. So that pool of potassium is big. And so like 50 kgs of potassium might sound like a lot, but that's really not a lot. Is where you know 15 kgs of phosphorus would be a lot. Can, can I just add to that, Robert? If that's oh, right. absolutely. Go ahead. It's actually uh, unless you mistime your potassium fertilizer applications, it's not the potassium fertilizer potassium that leaches. What happens is because of what Robert just said that the herbage runs at, uh, particularly the grass component, runs at three to 4% K, if there's a reasonable K supply in the soil, the animals come along and eat that, there's excess K for the animals, it ends up in the urine and it's urinary K that leaches as opposed to fertilizer K per se. That's the mechanism of K loss. Cool, yeah, so if you're putting on large amounts of potassium, it certainly pays to split it up. Yeah, yeah. but But, these guys, like the guys that are on the call, I would say, I would suggest use little, uh, little amount of potassium. If they use any, it's 20 to, for pastures, this is not crops, 20 to 30 kilograms uh, per hectare would cut it out, I would say. You know, over on the East Coast, uh, West Coast and dairy situations, you know, yes, we have a issue where we have to put quite a lot on several split applications. Absolutely. Yeah, and add to that for sheep farmers is that dairy farms, because milk has a lot of potassium in it, ship a lot more potassium off the farm and end up using fertilizer at higher rates. Yep. The other aspect of that question was around TBK testing. What are your recommendations there, Robert? Um, I wouldn't plan on getting TBK. pretty much anything from weathering rocks and just the quick test K is good enough. Cool. Okay, uh, awesome. Uh, well, 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 so there are some soils that do have considerable amount of reserve K. But, but again, probably not in the Otago, uh, central Otago area, but certainly in other areas. And it is useful um, because you won't get a potassium response if you put potassium on, because there's enough coming from the, uh, the reserves. But for the group that we're talking to, probably not an issue. Cool, thanks, Vince. And another one for you on the remote sensing technology. Um, I think you alluded to some of this. Is how far away is that technology for the general farmer? Uh, well, as I as I say, um, both uh, cooperatives uh, offer a entry level, um, which is uh, which is a, a, a pretty basic variable rate strategy um, based on slope and. Uh, and maybe aspect, right? So they split your farm up into three slope categories and the rate is different depending on that slope. That's the sort of basic entry one. Uh, and then there's the more uh, more uh, 
comprehensive one where we do a lot more soil testing to try and differentiate the fertility in the different land management units and come up with a variable rate strategy for that. That can be done now as well, provided that that um, you have a GIS based map for the farm and a plane or a truck capable of taking those shape files and then putting the, the rates of fertilizer on. So that can be done now. The hyperspectral scanning, we were going to launch it um, this year, uh, maybe in spring in a, in a very, what we call a soft launch. In other words, we'll probably only do it on one or two farms. The problem for us uh, is that because, uh, you know, for very good reasons, farmers aren't buying fertilizer, uh, we ain't got no money left to do anything at the moment. Let's put it crudely. <laughs> Cool, thanks, Ants. Um, so that'll, that'll slow it down. That'll slow down. But. Um, I'm not sure who wants to answer this one. Maybe we'll go to you first, Robert, and then also to Ants. Is, as sulfur is important to apply yearly, <laughs> is it likely to see high sulfur content products coming back on the market, such as Maxi? Who's um, that, too? Sorry. No, oh, that was to Rob. Oh. Yeah. I'm not sure what Maxi is. Is that a sulfur super? It's a, yeah, it's a 50% element. Well, it's a high concentration of elemental sulfur added to super. Yep. And does Ravensdale, Ravensdale still have one of those because Balance doesn't? No, we don't either because nobody was buying it, believe it or not. Yeah, I really Apparently. like those products. <laughs> and that was the cheapest way to get sulfur. It, uh, particularly in the hill and high country of the South Island, as you say, which is more sulfur deficient than it is phosphate deficient. That's right. Yeah, and so... You can correct me if I'm wrong, but when they're making superphosphate, they're reacting phosphate rocks with sulfuric acid. And with right. that, you get some sulfur in the super because oh, yeah. sulfur is about 9% P and about 10% S. Yeah. But what they were doing in the mixing process in that, you know, fizzing it up process was throwing in extra sulfur and making these sulfur fortified superphosphates, which were amazingly good products. And they still have 20% and 30%. But I really like that fifty percent one. Yeah. So there are, if if any of our people are listening to this, there are people in the company who want us to produce it again. But I'm not sure uh, where we're at with that. The the maxi I'm talking about. So yeah, particularly in the high country, it was nice because you had a bunch of elemental sulfur and some sulfate sulfur. Yep. And yes, so those yes. people that are putting it on every two or three years that would carry that, it through. That that's right. It's for the yeah, that's exactly so, right. Yeah, I would say hound the fertilizer co-ops and make them produce that. Yeah, that's it. That's the story. <laughs> cool. Hey, we might um, wrap the session up there, but that was um, great, guys. Um, thank you both for answering those questions and, and for everyone to posing them to our speakers. Um, I just want to say a big thank you for Robert and Ants for giving up the evenings to um, come and talk to us. I think this has been a really interesting session and hopefully it's given you some key tips to go away and have a chat to your fruit roof about. Um, this webinar is going to be made available for you to rewatch. So um, we'll send a link out to you once it's ready to go. Um, and I'll also put, post that on the Beef and Lamb Central Cargo Farming for Profit Facebook page. So if um, you've got any people that you don't know that haven't seen it, they can jump on there and, and watch it at a later date. Next week's session, um, we'll outline the latest sheep and beef um, research being conducted at Massey University, Lincoln University and Ag Research to help you stay ahead of the game. Um, please note that you'll need to make sure you register separately for this one. So if you've registered for this event, um, you'll still need to go back in and register for the next um, two webinars as well. So you can do that via the Beef and Lamb events page. Uh, once webinar series is what you need to look up. Um, but that's all from me. Thank you all very much for attending and we'll see you next week. Cheers. Thank you.